Here's who I want to introduce you to. This past summer, we experienced our camp in Panama City with our relevant youth, and uh, we had an incredible time on the beach with a man, an evangelist by the name of Tyshawn Rowland. Tyshawn spoke a message that I'm asking him to share with you today about answering the call of God on your life and how to know when God is speaking to you. It was such a powerful time as I saw many of our students respond to the call of God on their life. And today I'm praying that as Tyshawn shares, it'll also have the same impact on your life. So church, would you put your hands together, stand to your feet and welcome another friend of Relevant Church, Tyshawn Rowland. Exciting. Exciting. You don't have to stand up for me, but we can give it up for Jesus one time. Who's excited to be in the house of God? Can we give Jesus a shout of praise? That is amazing. That is amazing. Oh, look at those cornrows up there. They look fresh. I just got them done yesterday. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. But so excited to be able to share with you. But before I say anything, just want to honor your pastors. When I was a kid, we had this preacher come in for a conference. I think I was 16 years old. And he said, God gives gifts to the church in the form of leadership. And so if you ever want to know if you're blessed, look at your pastors. And I know that you're blessed because Pastor Carl and his wife, Julie, and their amazing kids are an incredible family. Aren't we just grateful for the gift that pastor, that God has given us? And I'm so blessed that your pastor, you know, there's a lot of people in ministry that I look up to that I connect with that are driven and motivated. And he is one of those guys. Like, I remember the first time I talked to him, I just felt like I wasn't doing enough for Jesus. Like, I was like, he was like, what'd you do this morning? And he told me what he did first. I was like, well, I woke up at three o'clock and I began to seek his presence. That's what I did, you know, at 3 a.m. Um, but just to see all the incredible things he does, I'm inspired by that. But the way, the way that he rests, I'm also inspired by that too. And so we're grateful that we have pastors that not just run hard, but they rest hard. So can we just thank God one more time for our leaders? <clears throat> And I think it would be good just for us to pray. And I don't know if you're watching, Pastor Carl, if you are, stop watching me. You're making me nervous, sir. But uh, if you are watching, what are you doing? You should be resting. Like, come on, you'll be here next week. But can we just extend our hands to the camera as a representation that we're praying for our pastors? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Pastor Carl and Julie and the family. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over that family, over the union of that marriage. Lord, I pray that as they rest, that you reveal to them vision. You reveal to them exciting things for this next season, that you give him strategy and wisdom for what's to come. God, we thank you for who he is, and we thank you for who he's been to us. God, continue to cover that family, cover those children in the mighty hand of God. And everybody said, everybody said, Amen. And uh, I am privileged today. Well, I'm going to be honest, y'all are privileged. I'm privileged all the time because I'm married to her. But um, I'm privileged because I have pretty much my whole family here uh, in the front row. So can you give it up for my incredible wife, Victoria? My mom is here. Her husband, my stepfather, Stacy, and one of our close friends, Ali Shaw. Can you guys all stand up? This is your moment. This is your moment. Stand up. Everybody stare at them awkwardly. Don't clap, though. Just stare. Just stare. I'm just totally joking. Guys can take a seat. Cool story is that my mom, um, my mom has only seen me preach uh, one other time in person. This is her second time seeing me preach. I think at this point, I probably preached hundreds of messages, um, but for some reason, she didn't want to watch any of those, but she came to this one. So, uh, so glad that my mom gets to be here, and she lives here in Georgia. And so, I am from Gainesville, Georgia, which is a little bit uh, drive from here. And so, if you ever want to come hang over there in our parts, you know, we can go to a free chapel service, do Waffle House, do what do in Georgia, and then we'll have fun. So, uh, so grateful. Someone asked me last service if I have kids. I don't have kids. I have a dog. I named him the Holy Ghost because because I take this Jesus stuff very seriously. But for real, I do call him Ghost. He's a small lab, and he really is demonic. So pray for us. And um, so grateful. I had our piano player, but he said I'm done. So uh, he's gone. So I'm gonna play. I'm just joking. But I'm gonna read a few few verses. I'm going to read from verse 15 to verse 22 of chapter 21 of 2 Samuel. So who's excited for the word? Are you guys excited? I heard this is a Bible-believing church, right? Very nice. That's really good. Opposed to, I don't know what else we would read, but let's see what, what the Lord has to say. Verse 15, there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. 
And Ishbi Binab, one of the descendants of the giants whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, you shall no longer go with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. After this, there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushite struck down Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jer- Jer- can you pronounce it? Can, can someone pronounce this? If you can pronounce this verse, you, you, you definitely go into heaven. I'll just tell you that much. If you, that's the secret word. You say the name, he lets you in. He's like, you're a believer. Come on in. And there was again war at Gath between was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, and 24 in number. He was also descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four descended from the giants in Gath. They fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. I want to preach a simple message entitled, From Generation to Generation. Can we bow our heads and pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing moment to preach your word. Lord, I pray that you would use me over these next few moments to speak. God, I thank you in advance that you've already gone before me. I thank you in advance that people are going to be set free, and I thank you that people are going to see you for who you are, and we know that once they see you, they will never be the same. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody set? Everybody set? Amen. Amen. If you see me looking at the camera a lot, again, I got my cornrows yesterday, so I can't stop looking at them and be quite honest. I just see them, and I say, God, you're good. But, um, Really excited to share this sermon, but uh, I got to teach in the front of it, and so I want you to pay attention because if you don't pay attention to these first five minutes, the last five minutes, if people are crying, you're going to be incredibly confused, and that's because you decided to be on your phone during the service, and so don't do that because God can't see you, and again, it can keep you from going to heaven. I don't want you to go to hell because you're watching on your phone now. I'm just joking, just teasing, but... um. I I need to talk about King David. This story, King David's a little bit older. He's about in his 60s or 70s. But before you know about older David, you have to know about younger David because younger David is the one that most of us think of when I say David. If you grew up in church, you know the story of David and Goliath. If you don't know the story, it's my privilege to tell you there was a man who was huge in stature. To me, I'm 5'8". If you're 5'9", you're huge. But He was probably like six, four or seven foot or something like that. He was a giant. He was taunting the people of Israel for over 40 days. No one dared to face this man named Goliath. There was a whole army there. There was a whole bunch of men there that at any given point could have faced him, but they didn't want to face him because they felt like they could not fight him. And I judge them when I read this story, but at the same time, I realize that there's areas in my life that I refuse to face. And when you refuse to face the areas that God is calling you to face, It's hard to have victory in those same areas. And so I see these men avoiding this fight, avoiding this giant, avoiding this person that somebody's going to have to fight. Now, David, for 40 days, was serving his brothers. His dad, Jesse, would send him to the battleground. He would send him with snacks. And every time David would go, he would go and he would be inquisitive. And he started asking these questions. And he would ask a question, what happens if someone were to kill that guy named Goliath, and someone overheard Dave, and they said, I'm glad you asked, because if you kill Goliath, what you're going to get is that you're going to get a house, you're going to get some money, and you're going to get a wife. And everybody who's single and broke said, amen, in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Imagine one thing could fix all those things. You know, just a man, a house, a crib, some crypto, man, God would be good. And David hears about this, and when David hears about it, he's like, well, I think I'm going to fight Goliath. If you out here handing out wives and you handing out houses and stuff, I want to get some. And so Saul sends for David. Now, the only reason he sends for David is not because David's anointed. It's not because David's anointed to be king. Many people believe that the reason David fought Goliath is because God anointed him to be that. I don't believe that. The reason he fought Goliath is because he asked. 
The reason he fought Goliath is because he was inquiring. The reason he fought Goliath is because he was curious. And if you're not careful, you will see in your life that curiosity is a key to unlocking your calling. If you just ask questions enough, eventually somebody is going to send for you. Somebody somewhere is going to hear about you inquiring about what happens if you were to defeat this guy. And Saul hears about David, and he inquires after David, and he sends for David, and David gets in front of Saul, and the first thing he says is, man, where is my money? I'm just joking, doesn't say that. But he says, I want to fight Goliath. And, da- and Saul looks at young David, and he is blessed by it because these last few weeks, no one has dared to even consider fighting David or d- consider fighting Goliath. Yet here's David. And Saul sees David, and and David says, listen, I need to fight him. I know you don't want me to fight him. I know you don't think I'm qualified to fight him, but I need to tell you a little secret about me. The secret is, is that you don't know this, but I defeated a lion. And Saul says, like, a real lion? Like, Like Simba? He says, I defeated a lion. He's like, okay. He said, then I defeated a bear. And Saul's like, oh, my, come on, stop playing. Lion, tigers, and bears, are you serious? And he says, I killed them both. And just like them, this man is going to fall at the hand of the Lord. See, what Saul didn't know about David is that David was qualified, not because of something that he did, but something that he went through. And you have to know that you are qualified for future blessings because of things that you have gone through. And I know there's people under the sound of my voice that you feel like I'm not qualified for anything. There's no way that God has anything in store for me that is great. There's no way that God has a plan for me that is awesome. No, he does have it because think about all the things that you have been through. There are people in this room, you shouldn't be sitting here in church all dressed up on a Sunday. You know who you used to be. Some of y'all used to be crazy. Some of y'all used to be cussing out Christians. Now you're praising God in the front row. Look at all the things that God has done through you. Look at all the things that God did through David. And so David says, I'm qualified to fight Goliath. You want to know why? Because I fought things in secret. And if you ever want God to give you something in public, make sure you're fighting things in secret. Make sure you're winning secretly. It's one thing to win with the crowd. It's a whole other thing to win alone, win by yourself, when nobody's looking, when no one's noticing, but in the midnight hour that you are slaying your necessary battles. And David says this to Saul, and Saul sees David, and he says, you know what, David? I'm going to give you some, I I want you to go fight Goliath, so I'm going to put my armor on you. I'm going to give you my stuff. That's usually the temptation when we see somebody. We want to give them a little bit too much. And the Bible says that the army armor didn't fit. Now, what I wish is said, yet. Because how many of you know that things that don't fit you today eventually will fit you one day? You know, I remember being younger and people would prophesy certain things over my life. And when I was a teenage boy, whether I was 15 or 16, people would come to the church and they would look at me and they would see the hand of God on me. And they would say, that young man is anointed to preach. And I would agree with the prophecy. And right after the prophecy, I'd be like, give me the microphone. But they would not give me the microphone because at 16 years old, it was just a prophecy. At 16 years old, it was just potential. But sometimes we need to let reality play out real quick to see if those prophecies are going to remain in potential form or if they're actually going to begin to walk out as a purpose for your life. And when I was younger, there were things that didn't fit me, but I'm grateful that the thing that didn't fit me then now fits me today. And I want to encourage someone that's trying on armor that doesn't fit. You keep trying on that armor. You give it a few years. You'll become the man that you're called to be. You give it a few years. You'll become the woman you're called to be. Don't grow weary in doing good because today it seems hard. Know that tomorrow there will be a day where your muscles will allow that armor to fit. Your experience will allow that armor to fit. And the life you're living will make sense of the thing that God is giving to you. So David fights Goliath, and this is the moment. He takes not a sword. He doesn't take an army, armor. He takes a rock. Imagine this. He's like, that's Goliath? Oh, I got you, boy. I got you. You just stand right there. <laughs> yeah, this right here. And everyone, a whole bunch of men are watching this little boy. Like, what is he about to do? And he's like, oh, y'all about to see. Y'all ain't ready. Y'all ain't ready. And they're like, what is he doing? He was like, I'm whipping it, bro. I'm whipping it. I'm getting it ready. And it may look silly, but when it's anointed, that's all that matters. 
Because when you're anointed for it, people may laugh at it, but when they see that it works, they'll get behind it. And I've seen people laugh at the very thing they got behind because they realized that they were laughing at the leader that God was raising up. Be careful who you laugh at. I've seen people laugh at some people that now I look at where they're at in their life, and I'm grateful that I wasn't one laughing at them. I'm committed. Anytime my friends are in a low season, I bless them, and I say, hey, remember me, because one day... I think God could put you up in a place of significance, and I don't want to be the person you remembered as someone who brought you down instead of someone who lifted you up. And David fights Goliath, and he goes over to Saul, and he says, hey, um, here's the head of Goliath, catch. Um, So which one of these women do I get to marry? (laughs) And all these girls are like, dad. He was like, dad, nothing. We're protected. You better marry this man. So he marries the one of them. He gets a house, he gets his crypto, and not even unbeknownst to David, he even gets a song. Saul has slain thousands, being killing thousands. And the Bible says that David slayed tens of thousands, which if you're Saul, you're like, I hate this song. I like the first part. I like the first lyric. The second part, tens of thousands. You see, David, it wasn't just a song. That song became a reality in David's life, and he did double exceedingly abundantly above anything Saul could ever ask, think, or imagine, David did. Saul didn't like that. Saul began to chase David. Saul tried to kill David. But it didn't matter because the call of David was still pure. And if the call of David on your life is pure, it doesn't matter what man tries to do because man can't stop what God has started. So man tries to stop David. And we see David multiple times going to the cave of Adullam because sometimes when you're tired of being stopped, you try to stop yourself. So David would have seasons where he would give up, and we would have seasons where people would try to want him to give up. But no matter what, David did not give up on the call of God. David kept waiting on God. Eventually, Saul dies. When Saul dies, God raises up David. David becomes the king of Israel, not just the king that the people wanted, but he became the king the people needed because David was a man not after the people's heart, but he was a man after God's heart. You have to be careful when you're positioned in in a position over people that you don't care so much as much as the people as much as about God because following people will lead you to places that God doesn't want you to be. But when you're following God, he will lead you to places that the people are supposed to be. And David knew this. And this is why David was a good king. And this is why David was essential because David goes on to establish incredible things through the kingdom of Israel. David goes on to sing many songs that we now quote and preach from in the book of Psalms. David goes on not to give up, not to give in, not to throw in the towel. David keeps going, and David comes to a place where he has now lived a very eclectic life. There are people that I'm preaching in front of right now, and there are some people that life is just starting for you, but there are some people that you have lived an eclectic life. You have lived some lives. You live some lives that your children don't know about. Don't laugh, but you know who you are. Some of you telling your children lies. I've always followed Jesus. No, you did. Not in the 80s, you did. Not in the 80s. In the 80s, you got crazy. In the 90s, it got weird, but it was okay. The recession hit at 08. We all started believing for God again, so that's all that happened there. But I stand in front of people who have lived life. I stand in front of people that have gone to battle, that you have gone to war, that you have some scars, that you have some wounds, and your wounds tell stories that could help a group of people. Maybe you find yourself like David, because David was once a warrior, but now in the first sentence, the last sentence of the first verse, it says David got tired. He grew weary. And it's interesting when you watch a warrior get weary. Because when I think of David, the last thing I think of is tired. When I think of David, I think of someone who's going to stand in front of of adversity and stand in the front of it and stop it and kill it. But this story that we read about David, this is a story where David almost dies. The Bible says a a giant was coming after David, and David probably got a flashback of Goliath of his younger years and said, hey, I killed Goliath, I'm going to kill this guy. So he goes to grab his sword, and because, again, he's not as young as he used to be, he doesn't grab it as quick as he thought he grabbed it. He thought he did this. Meanwhile, it was like, I'm going to kill this day. I'm going to kill this Goliath. And Abishai, one of David's mighty men, was there and said, hey, David, 
You put the sword down. Your sword season is over, David. David looks at Abishai like, you shouldn't tell me what to do. But Abishai looks at David and says, hey, if we lose our leader, we're going to lose our direction. If they lose me, we're just going to lose a soldier. So, David, we need you to be protected because the people of Israel need you, David. We not just need the warrior that's in you. We need the wisdom that comes from you. So, David, we must protect you because we need your wisdom. I need to say this to some people under the sound of my voice. God is protecting you because we need your wisdom. The wisdom that you've collected in this life from marriage, from business, from children, for some of you even great-grandchildren, the wisdom that has been collected in your life, we need it in this season of our world. Because like I read four times in this text, it says we are at war again. I need to say this, I believe that we are as the church at war again. When you wake up in the morning and you look at the news and you see the things that young people are going through and you see the thing that young married couples are facing, when you see what we're going through financially, we are at war again. When you see what our children are going through, when you see what young people are facing, when you see what you are facing, we are at war again. There's peaceful times, there's good times, there's places, there's seasons to have fun, as the Bible says, but there are also seasons to go to war, and we are here again. Now, to some young people, you are not at war again, you are at war. And it's maturity to listen to those who've been there again than instead of trying to listen to yourself just because you've been there the first time. I don't know who this is for, but you're not the first generation to face insecurity. I don't know who you are, but you're not the first generation to face anxiety. You're not the first generation to also go through bad clothing habits. But hey, that's not my sermon. It's not my sermon. But the 70s were rough. Some of y'all were wearing some weird stuff, okay? We brought a lot of things back, but we didn't bring everything back. Some things need to stay back there. We are at war again. And now that we're at war again, the question is now, who is going to fight? Because it can't be David. Because David has already fought his battle. David has already got his rewards. David has already did what we needed David to do. But now David is getting tired and God is looking for somebody new. God is looking for some young giant slayers who are going to say, God, what you did through my mom, would you do through me? God, what you did through my pastor, would you do through me? God, there's been a lot of people that have gone before me, but God, could you use me like you've used those person in the past? When I think of David, I can't help but to think of someone like my pastor, Pastor Jensen Franklin. I have had the privilege, I'm not going to lie, but some people brag about a lot of stuff. I'm going to brag about what I've gotten to do. I've gotten to work for, I think, the coolest preachers and pastors in the world. From Pastor Jensen Franklin to Stephen Furtick to Elevation Worship to Free Chapel Worship to Ford Conference to all these things that I have personally just got to be in the room of. And every now and again, I just start lifting my hand and say, God, if you're going to do it again, would you use me? God, if you're going to raise up another preacher, could you use me? If there's a line to become like one of those people, well, put me in it. I can't fit any other lines because I'm too short, so maybe the line to be used by God Even short people can stand in that line. All my short kings say, amen. Amen. I can't hear you. We got to speak louder. (laughs) I look at what God has done before in our world. And I'm also saying, God, would you do it again? Would you raise up another generation that loves the things of God? Can you raise up another generation that serves the house of God? Could you raise up another generation that's going to be worshipers in the house of God? God, what you did before, Lord, would you do it again? In this story in 2 Samuel is evidence that what God does in one generation, he multiplies in the next. Because he didn't just raise up one David. He raised up a Jonathan, a Elhanan, a Sibachai, multiple. It's Abishai, four young leaders in this story that all killed giants to show us that God is going to do it again. I don't know who this is for, but you've been praying that God would do it again in your family. He's going to do it again in your family. He's going to multiply it in your family. What's, what was done in you will be done and multiplied in the next generation. David has seen a lot of things in his day, but this is the first time David gets to see someone like him. 
I need to say this to someone in the room. You think you're the only one. No, God is raising up another. God is raising up somebody else that loves like you love, that leads like you leads, that sees how you see. There is another generation that's coming behind you. And you know what they need? They don't need you to teach them how to throw a rock because they have a sword. If David would have sat down with Abishai and said, hey, I'm going to tell you how to kill your giant. You go in the back, you got to pick a smooth rock. You don't just pick any rock. you got to get a smooth rock. El- Elhanan would be like, hey, David, um, we use swords in these streets, sir. <laughs> I know you guys did it with stones, but we do it differently. It's the same thing. We just do it differently. I need to say this to generation that's gone before us. What you see happening in us, it's the same thing that happened in you. It's just different. It's just different. Some of us are shorter. Some of us don't use stones. Some of us use swords, but all of us have something. It's just different. And what God is going to do in the next generation may not be the same, but it will be different. And you see David looking at all these younger leaders, and he could be tempted to feel like, well, I'm being replaced. Well, if you're raising up another generation to fight giants, then what do you need me to do? Because I'm the guy you bring out to fight Goliath, but now it seems like there's another fighters to fight Goliath. So what do you need from David? I think that's a question that maybe some people in this room that that are seasoned. You're not old, you're seasoned. Sprinkled with gray. Look at you. (laughs) Seasoned. Some of y'all are old, though. You got an old spirit, okay? But maybe you're a little bit older and you're wondering, well, what is my position in what God is going to do in the next season of this church? I'll tell you, we need from you what we needed from David. We need your wisdom. We need you to sit down with some younger leaders. Listen, there's someone in this room, you can't stand young people. Well, we need you. (laughs) And maybe if you help us lead, you probably will be able to stand us eventually. And I'm praying right now, and I think what God is doing in our generation is that he's giving young people boldness, and he's giving us patience, And he's giving some of us honor. Some of you don't want to give to the next generation because you don't think the next generation honor you, but we do. We honor the fact that you fought for us. We honor the fact that you've gone before us. We honor the fact that we wouldn't be able to be who we are without mom being who she is. I stand on this platform not because God gave me a gift. I stand on this platform because God gave my mom some prayers. So I can't, I'm not standing on my gift. I'm standing on the foundation of the generation that's come before. We need you. We need the next generation to get behind. If you're young and and you're here and you're saying, how do I know if I'm young? You can get up real fast. (laughs) You get up real fast. You just get right up and you just just keep strutting, just going. It's like, you young. If you can do this, you're like, why are they laughing? You're young. You don't get it. I just turned 30 a few months ago, church. I'm not lying. I stretched my back and I was like, oh, this is it. (laughs) It's happening. It's happening. Someone invest. I find myself looking at walkers on Amazon. It's going crazy right now. I don't know. But if I can look at my life as I turn 30, I made a decision. No one asked me to do this. Didn't read this anywhere. I just felt it in my spirit. Tyshawn, honor your Davids. It was simple. July 22nd, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. I woke up in the morning, and all God said was, honor your Davids. Because if God can trust you to honor the last generation, he'll trust you to lead the next generation. If you can't honor what's come before you, young people, God will never put you first, even if it makes logical sense. God will withhold you because God forbid he, get, he lets that pride get ahead of you. And most people can never walk in their purpose because they're controlled by their pride. And the best thing to kill pride, if you want the antidote to destroying pride in your life, find a David and serve him. Find a David that's so big that who you are doesn't even matter in comparison. You know how it feels? I can only say this here, but serving under who I believe wanted to be one of the greatest evangelists in the world, people don't care about any of my sermons. Hey man, Tyshawn, what are you preaching? No one cares about what I'm preaching. We care about what my pastor's preaching. What is Pastor Jensen preaching this weekend? And if I'm careful, if I'm not careful, I can get arrogant. Well, why don't they see me the same way they see him? Well, number one, Tyshawn, it's not about you. 
and say that to some young person in this room. The reason God's not blessing you is because you're too concerned with you. Maybe if you just start serving the next generation, it would be the best thing for you. Now, I only, but before you apply and before you accept this sermon, I need to tell you a key difference between these next, this new generation of giant slayers. The difference between the new generation and the last generation, the last generation, they had to fight things that you're never gonna fight. There are things I will never face because my mom has faced them already. There are things I'm never gonna fight because my father fought it already. So the beauty of coming behind a David is that you're behind a pioneer. Someone that's already fought those battles, someone that's already gone before you, it's beautiful. But this is what's hard if you're coming behind a David. The end of this story ends like this. It says that the giants fell by the hand of David in the hand of his servants. That's not true. David almost died. So how is it that they fell by the hand of David? They fell by David's servants. But at the end of the day, see, when you're serving under the king, the king always gets the credit. See, when you're serving Jesus, Jesus always gets the credit. I can't say that I'm up here because of me. I'm up here because Jesus gets the credit. He gone before me, he died for me. Because of the shed blood of who he is, I get to be everything that I am. It's Jesus, he gets the credit. And we see that all these boys, none of them got a song. If I was one of the boys, I would have asked for my song, especially the guy who killed somebody with six toes. Come on. Come on, six toes? Six fingers? I don't get a lyric? No, you don't get a lyric because leadership doesn't come with lyrics. I don't get a mention? No, because being a man doesn't come with mentions. I don't get riches? No, you don't, because the greatest riches you get is in Jesus Christ and who he is. So if you're following Jesus to get something from Jesus, he's already given you the best thing he can ever give you. That is his son. That is his blood. That is his mercy. That is his grace. We are already give, given the greatest thing. But I do believe that we're entering a time in our world. It's dark out there. I love church on Sunday because it's the one moment throughout the week where it's like almost all that noise out there doesn't matter. You can come here and you can get taken care of. You can get your spirit right. You can get a worship song. You can get a word. Sometimes the word ain't always wording, but sometimes it gives you what you need. You know, hopefully today you got what you need. Listen, he'll be back next week. Okay, don't judge me. But we're going to go back out there into that world where it's pest full of pestilence and wars and rumors of wars and, and family fighting family and friends fighting friends and finances not showing up the way you wanted and disappointments showing up in places you never anticipated and you're wondering, what do I do? You keep serving the church because my Bible tells me that the local church is the hope of the world. And when the world gets hurting, which it will, it's gonna get worse, but they're gonna come into a church like this and when the world doesn't know where to go, they go to the church. And I want them to come to a church that they say, hey, whether you're 19 or whether you're 99, I want them to come to this church because they feel like this church is a generational church, that whether you just got fresh from the womb or whether you're going to see Jesus very soon, it does not matter who you are, that you can come to this church because this church is a generational church. There are, some, there are some people in this room that you've been praying about what to do and you feel like, man, I'm in the best seasons of my life. I don't have anything to worry about. Money's not my worry. I've invested in my 401k. I'm sitting and I'm resting. What can I do next? Invest in the next generation. We need you. I don't need wisdom from another 30 year old with cornrows. I'm not gonna listen to him. I'm not. Unless his cornrows are really good, I'm not gonna listen to him may go where he goes, but I'm not going to listen to him. I'm in a season of my life where if you got gray, hey, I'm listening to you. When someone says don't live like that, I just, I just agree. When someone says live like this, I'm just going to do it. Why? Because the Bible says walk with the wise and become wise. If you are young and you're living a foolish life, find someone in church today. 
Just find somebody and walk up to them. I don't care how weird you feel. I want you to walk up to someone. And it would be better if someone random walks up to someone random, like if a 16-year-old black kid walks over to someone who is, looks like they're in their seven-year-old white man and says, hey, would you be my father? <laughs> and you may feel awkward, but you might, well, will you be my son, you know? <laughs> Because what you may not know is that he's asking to be his father because someone walked out on him. And he's talking to women. He don't know how to talk to women, right? Because the guy that was supposed to teach him how to do it left. And the person that was going to teach him how to be good with money left. And the person that was going to teach him how to be good with purity left. And so he shows up to church and he sees you every week with your family. And you guys show up and your kids are well. And your kids are obedient. And your wife loves the Lord. And you love the Lord. And you get back into your car and you go back into your life. And every week that guy is looking at you wondering, God, can I have that? And maybe that's not your story, but that was my story every week at church. And I just came to the point where I was like, my mom would tell you, I just started walking up to people and say, hey, you're my daddy now, sir. And this guy taught me how to hold a tie. That guy told me how to hold a mic. This man told me how to live right. That guy told me how to love my wife. This guy teaches me how to preach. This guy teaches me how to live. This guy teaches me how to be patient. This guy teaches me how to handle my anger. There's multiple men in my life that are teaching me as a young man how to be a young man from older man. You know why? Because we need from generation to generation. If you're looking at something to invest in, stop investing your money into things and invest your money into people. Invest in the next generation so that the people are protected. Invest in the next generation so the pasture is protected. And invest in the next generation because you still want to keep walking out your purpose. You're not done. Well, no, I am done. No, believe me, if you were done, you would be up there with him. But you're still here. And you're still here because you got some things you need to do. And it's time for some of you who are older to stop waiting on younger people to walk up to you. And you walk up to them and you say, hey, I'm here if you ever need anything. And I've had people do that for me. And the reason I can be everything and I, I'm called to be is because of leaders that have gone before me. But now if you're young, listen, I don't, I don't know where the clock is. I've got a minute and 50 seconds. If you're young, I want you to listen up and listen up well. Num number one, you don't know as much as you think you know. TikTok has been substituted for thinking. Instagram has become a substitute for int intelligence. And we got young people with a lot of followers thinking because a lot of people shared this, I'm wise. No, you're not wise. They just shared that. That's all that happened there. That's just a whole lot of shares and no wisdom because wisdom comes with weight. And you may be young and you may be talented and you may be gifted, but can you be submitted? Because if you sum submit yourself, my favorite verse, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God and at the right time, he will lift you up. If you're in here and you're a young person, here's your application after this sermon. You need to serve this church. Whether that's you holding the door, whether that's you leading a group, you need to serve this church. If you're a young person, you need to start giving to the church. Well, I don't have money. Start giving now so when you get money later, it doesn't, it doesn't cost your heart for you to give to the kingdom. A lot of young people, God wants to bless you so much at, at, at a young age. Well, no, God doesn't want to bless me. At 16 years old, I wanted a car. I gave $60 because I made $616 from Smith's grocery store. I gave $60. I remember giving it, and I said, God, I want a car. Literally a week later, my mom said, hey, you need to go over to so-and-so's house. I'll go over to this man's house, and he hands me a check for $2,000. She's like, I don't know why. I just know you needed a car. Just want to invest in you. You know why? Because at a young age, I invested into the house of God. So you don't need to be rich to sow because that principle is not for the rich, it's for the believer. If you're a believer, you need to be given. And if you're young, you need to get behind who is older. And if you're older, you need to start giving who's younger. And as we see you do that, what will happen is that this church will take on a whole new form and we will see God do in this community what he's never done before. This church is growing, and I want to tell you as an evangelist, that's not normal to say to churches around America. You know why? Because churches aren't growing in America. They're closing doors. You know what usually is an announcement that I have to deal with when I get up to preach? Hey, we used to have this service. We don't have that service anymore, so I want everyone to come to this service. Then I get up and I preach to people who used to be excited because the church used to be growing. 
So now I'm here and I hear the pastor is asking a few families to move to the 830. He's asking you to do that because we need space because the world is hurting and the world can come to church and God forbid they miss out on their miracle because someone doesn't want to leave the 10 o'clock service or the 11 o'clock service. So I want to encourage you, the one simple thing that you can do to make room for what God wants to do, just go to another service. But what I would love to do is pray for everyone who's here. And if you can, I want everyone to just stand and bow your heads as you stand. And if you're in here and you're saying, Pastor Tyshawn, when you were talking about David getting weary, I feel like that's me. I feel like I'm tired and I feel like I need prayer. I would love to pray for you. If you're in this room and you're saying, I'm, I'm a little weary, I would love to pray. When I count to three, I just want you to lift your hands. One, two, three. Let me see who I'm praying for. Let me see. I see you. 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 Heavenly Father, with every hand that is lifted, I pray that you meet them at their need. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall afresh on them, not just in this room, but even as they go home. I don't know who this is for, but even as I'm praying for you, God is saying he's lifting the shame of the past away so you can step into the future to not grow weary in doing good for in due season, you're gonna reap a harvest. I don't know who this is, but for the man that's in this room that you are, you are praying for a reaping, God says he's gonna send it your way. God, I pray for the saints of this church that you will renew them, you will remind them, and you will reveal to them the purpose of investing into the next generation. God, I thank you for them in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you're young in here and you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm praying that God will give me a heart to submit. If there's some young people, I want you to lift your hands. If there's some young people that are wanna respond. As a matter of fact, if I could, if the young people, for the sake of time, because you can move faster, but could you run to the altar and stand right here? I just wanna pray for the young people. So I'm gonna count to three, one, two, three. Don't got a lot of time. So young people come up here, come up here, come up here, just right here. But what God is going to do in this church is not going to stop with a guest speaker. It's going to continue with these incredible young people. Just keep, keep coming up, keep coming up, keep coming up. I'm so sorry. I know I'm going a little bit too late, Pastor Mark. Don't, don't judge me, I promise. Could you guys extend your hands to these young people? And to these young people, I want you to look at me. Your time is coming. It's going to come. It's going to come quicker than you think. It comes faster than you think. And the only thing he wants you to be is ready. Just be willing. Just be willing to do whatever he asks you to do. Serve the house of God. Fall in love with the book. Fall in love with this book. You fall in love with this book, it will provide for you. Fall in love with this book, it will lead you to the places you need to go, the places that you've been praying to go, the places you've been begging to go. You follow this book. It's not found in those other men. It's not found in those other things. It's found in his book. And as you align yourself and you submit yourself to this, he's going to reap a harvest in your life. Can we extend our hands to these incredible young people? God, I thank you for each and every young person that's up here. God, for the young people that are up here and even the ones that aren't represented, Lord, would you bless them? Would you protect them? With the young people of this house, God, I thank you that protection will follow them. Provision will follow them, God. The favor of God will be on them every place that they go, God, that they will get the job. They will get the scholarship. They will get the opportunity. They will get the investment. They will not be passed by, that you would make it available for them. God, do it in them. What you've done in me, God, do it in them. I thank you that their best days are ahead of them. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, God, that the hand of God is on this man, that he will do incredible exploits for your kingdom. I bind the devil that's been coming against his mind and I plead the blood of Jesus and I say you will live and not die. You will walk in the will of God. And all the things that you're believing for, he will perform it in your life. God, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, that this word will not fall on deaf ears and it will not fall on stony ground, but God, it will fall and it will produce a harvest. I thank you that you're just getting started in this church and you're just getting started in this youth ministry. God, we thank you that we are a generation to generation church in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen.